seara, stimați telespectatori! Avem un subiect foarte provocator care reprezintă o noutate la nivel mondial și anume un standard de imunitate al clădirilor. Vorbim în termeni generici, dar în particular astăzi ne vom referi la clădirile de birouri, la felul în care va arăta viitorul loc de muncă, astfel încât fiecare dintre noi să se simtă în siguranță în locul de muncă, în contextul provocărilor de sănătate pe care le avem, cum ar fi pandemia prezentă sau orice altă situație viitoare. Pentru a discuta despre acest standard de imunitate al clădirilor, îl avem alături de noi pe domnul Gavin Bonner, vicepreședinte Genesis Properties. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonner, for having this opportunity to discuss this novelty. Um, of having an immune business uh, standard. And I want to ask you what, is, what it actually is, an immune business uh, standard or uh, um, uh, immune um, business um, approach of a building. Sure, um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just to put a, a little bit of background, um, if I can explain Genesis and, and that sort of it will give a, a little bit of context to how the, the immune building standard arose. Um, Genesis are property developers, but more importantly in this respect, they're property owners and also the facilities managers for their portfolio. So we have sort of um, over 150,000 square meters of office with prime tenants in it, international tenants, category A tenants. So that gives a little context to, to why the immune is of interest. Basically, we, we, we saw the pandemic, which has affected everybody, um, I think in some way, whether that be on a personal level, whether that be in a business level. And also the pandemic affects us in, in many different scenarios, whether it be physically, but also mentally, but also economically. I mean, things are changing because of the pandemic. So what we at Genesis Property wanted to look at is what can we do in respect of this um, pandemic that's in flow? Um, so we looked at the statistic that 90% of our time is spent in the, built in, in the built environment. So we kind of thought, well, hold up, if we spend so much time within this built environment, within the offices, within the residences, etc., what can those buildings do to protect us against this? So that was the, the start. So we wanted to look at what measures buildings could take to help us fight this pandemic. We have the medical division looking at their part, coming up with vaccines, etc. But we thought, the building can take a role in this. this. This is where we spend our time. So the building can take a role to actively try to stem or reduce the risk of the pandemic. So that's where the immune building standards was born out of. What is it we can do to support our tenants in their business decisions to whether to look to come back to works, uh, operate from home working. So we came up with all of these measures in essence, with targeting how to protect the building against um, viruses, bacterial, toxological. So although it was generated by the, the COVID-19 situation, it actually has taken it a little bit further and said buildings should protect our health in all circumstances. Period. Period, exactly. We, we kind of think, um, you know, I have children here at school, etc. But I think a lot of us have heard the bug is flying around the school or oh, the office is full of the flu or whatever. And it kind of made us think, well, why is that? Why can we not try to stop this transmission or, or stem the transmission at source? And have you, have you made an evaluation of the current situation in office buildings in general to see what are the main challenges or yeah, what, what we did, and, and this was this, um, what we did, is we set up, let's say, a task force because we actually think there are a number of elements that needs to be looked at. So you've got the medical implications, you have the engineering side, you have the architectural, you have the facilities management side, and we actually think that it has to be a combined effort. Not one is going to solve it. 
So what we're looking at is we set up a task force to go through the buildings and look at what measures can be implemented to help reduce the risk. So, you know, with these supporters, we, we've set up um, 150 measures um, of varying disciplines, as I say, this multi-team um, approach, to cover how we believe we can make the building safer against these sort of threats. And, and you, you check the building against these 150 measures or items yeah. that... Absolutely. Basically what we've done is we've put together a list of items that property owners, um, tenants, etc., people utilising buildings can regulate against. Now there are 150 items there. Um, and this is a kind of a scoring? It's definitely a scoring. It's a matrix that people go through. They can do a self-appraisal and what happens is after they have appraised their buildings it will give um, a figure as a percentage which will then band it into the three categories that we have of strong, powerful and, and resilient. So what it does is it equates how much has been done within that building. So it's not you have to implement all 153. Um, in some places your building may restrict some of those changes because we're talking about existing buildings. Um, so you may not be able to implement all 153. So therefore we've put up this mechanism, mechanism of scoring it in three different categories, with the top category being five star resilient, and then further down four star powerful, and then further down three star strong. So the new buildings that are done from now on can take this into consideration and have them already implemented in their engineering and architectural uh, uh, Absolutely, approach. and by doing it that way, um, you can implement them from source. Um, so the cost of having to do that is a lot more economic. You can make those your considerations. And what we're trying to do with it is when architects or new buildings have come up, they can review the measures and think about how they can implement them into the new building, which will have an improvement on our direct physical health within that building. So we believe we're setting out a framework to make the buildings a healthier environment. But uh, the main challenge will be with the existing buildings. You said uh, Genesis uh, owns 150,000 square meters. What does this mean in um, the big context, uh, in Bucharest, for example, do you have a general figure about uh, the square meters for office buildings? I would not have, I must admit. The reason that we targeted the existing offices first is that's where the, the main market is going to be. For new builds, they're going to come online over a period of time. And what? they will probably be more concerned and uh, with more uh, focused and means to implement uh, all those uh, 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 changes and items. Correct. The, they will have a lot more freedom. But I think what we wanted to do is to first have a look at the existing buildings because those are the ones, when people are allowed to return to work, those are the ones people will be going to. So that is the immediate need to improve the, the health of that building. So that's why we started with existing office buildings, that looking at this return to the work, how can we make that return a safer prospect? At the end of the day, it will be left with all of the, the companies to consider when it is right for them to return. However, what we can do is we can give them the tools that they know what their building is doing to protect any return to work policy. So what we believe we're doing is we're giving them a better choice of how they wish to operate. We still think home working will be around, there will be a hybrid version, um, but we do believe the office plays a centre role to business. So if we can improve the environment into which they're returning, then that makes their decision process a lot more flexible for them. They can consider that things have been done within that building to protect their um, staff, their occupants, 
so they, they feel a bit more trust within the building. And I think that is a big word, that people trust their building. And from, I, uh, from what I know, people started to put a lot of emphasis on the place, on the building itself, when making the decision to accept the job or not. This uh, uh, took a higher ranking into their um, ideas or their uh, decision-making process. I, again, totally agree with that. We do believe that there is a new paradigm coming. Um, you know, previously, um, you know, people would get interviewed. Um, now we believe that the companies rely upon their talent and talent can be very transitional in these periods. So the, the companies that can demonstrate that their building is actually, um, let's say, a desired requirement for that talent that they're trying to, to, to engage, we think that helps. And we think it is going to be the, the, the new future that people will say, okay, I'm looking to join your company, but can you show to me that I'm joining a good company but within a safe building, within a, an active building, one that is encouraging people to be there, rather than you know sort of the, the old transition where they were forced to turn up and work at a desk or whatever. So we believe there's a lot more that the, the building can offer the employee, and that will become one of the tools to gather that talent. And because we are speaking about the work for workplace of the future, uh, since through this uh, immune uh, index uh, standard, what kind of uh, facilities uh, should be present in this kind of buildings of the future? Well, th the first thing I must say is we, we must look at this immune standard to be present. Um, for us, this is one of the, the most important things, is protecting people's health. So, <clears throat> we, we do believe that the building of the future will incorporate these, um, these protocols. Um, other um, elements that we're looking at is more flexibility, more agility within the buildings. That means that people aren't fixed to a place. Um, we also believe that experience within the building or the business park is important. I think the days have gone where people are expected to come sit at their desk from nine till five, just at their desk, no other interactions. We believe now that it's a lot more experimental. People wish to be able to, to move around a bit more, be a bit more agile, use different facilities, have the availability of, let's say, working outside. They're not tied to their desk with the modern technologies. They can work in many places. So we believe that the future of the, the business park is to allow people to feel more of that community that they, they belong or, or they're happy to participate within the communal activities of the environment. And, and as I say, that means more social spaces and gathering points and to get interactions. Now that's not currently what can be done at this moment because of the pandemic, but we believe as things are calmed down with the pandemic, these social spaces are, are of great importance. And not all of them should be strictly work related. People need to, you know, sort of um, have their, their mind free. Um, they need a mel men a mental wellness. So they need to feel good within the space. And that doesn't always mean, you know, staying, working 100% without it. They need flexibility to go and have relaxation areas, to go and experience something just a little bit different. So. Um, one should not have the feeling of living in an aquarium, for example. Absolutely. That, that, that's 100% the point. Again, it, it's, we want people to feel part of the organisation, part of the environment. And to do that, you need communal gatherings and events so you don't feel isolated. Going through when we were preparing the immune building standard, we understood that the work from home, although it has many positives, there are drawbacks to it. And one of those was the feeling of isolation. <clears throat> um, because they were in, um, as you put it, an aquarium, they were on their own, they had no colleagues around them, they had no interface with, with others within the operations. And th they felt this isolation. 
they had no real distinction also between the life um, work. The private life and the... Exactly, work. that sort of blurred into one. So, you know, with the work or the office environment, it kind of encourages those things that they're not getting. It encourages those engagements between others. It encourages the social aspect. And that's where we think the, the future of office is, is going anyway. Um, however, now with the pandemic, we've need, um, needed to have a relook. But when offices relaunch, we do believe they will be the social, environmental um, setup that people require to be productive. Um, so at this time, we're gearing up for you know the, the pandemic, and, and obviously that requires a degree of separation. But we do believe that will go full circle and start putting people back together in a safe way with the building working in the background for their health. So I understand that this immune business standard is a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary effort to put together a lot of um, criteria for the building, but who will actually provide a certification for the building? The, the certification will come from the um, Healthy Design um, Building Institute. Um, this is uh, set up in, in Brussels. Um, so they look after, let's say, the accreditation. This is providing the certification. They also are responsible for the audit process on any assessments made. Um, the Institute will also look after the learning and the training that is necessary. So that will all come under this Healthy by Design Building Institute, um, which is, as I say, set up in Brussels and is now all incorporated there. Um, and they will run through. The assessors themselves will be uh, standalone um, trained and authorised companies. So the process that we're looking at is um, any... <clears throat> company can get access to the measures. Um, so usually what we expect is they will look at the measures, they will do a pre-assessment, they will understand what sort of rating they are aiming for, which level they are aiming for. Once they have made that assessment and what their ambitions are, that's when they would contact directly their own assessor. So that's something between them and the assessor. They go through the entire process, they put all the measures in place, the assessor tells them what scoring they get, what they have achieved, what the build, he will actually tick off that the measures are there and implemented. And this is through submission of evidence. And then once the assessor has uh, given his assessment, that goes to this um, institute. The institute then run an audit check on the assessment and once they are happy that the assessor has performed his job and it has been audited, they are the ones that then take over and issue the, the certificate, whichever it may be, whichever standard they have reached. So that's the, in a short way, the, the process going forward to how to obtain the standard. There is a need for any um, adjustment in the legislation in order for this to be implemented uh, properly? Um, Legislative support is always light. However, we believe that the standards can operate as standards independently. Um, the idea, like with the, with the fire, let's say, once an event comes, people say, oh crikey, we need fire legislation, we need codes, we need etc. What we believe, we, we've started the, the mission but we believe our standards will be looked at and then brought into legislation because they make sense to protect people's health. So at this moment in time, the standards themselves do not require a modification in the legislation. They can operate giving you all the advice of the good um, measures to be put into place that can be done. Um, where we are hoping later down the line that we do not forget what has happened here, we learn our lessons, and that going further down the line, the lessons we've learned will be gathered by the legislative bodies and saying we must do something to improve the health within the buildings. The technology is available, um, obviously, because we've placed all the measures together, but we are believing that let's not forget what happened this time round. Let's make sure our buildings in the future 
are prepared should such events happen again. Um, so that's where we are. But at the moment, our standards can be implemented across the board for all buildings. Um, and it is literally a decision by the, the, the stakeholder on what he wants to do to his building to make it safer for the occupants of that building. What uh, we have seen from this uh, pandemic uh, situation was that the authorities put uh, a lot of uh, focus on the public areas, uh, places where people interact and things like that. And I wanted to ask you from this perspective um, about uh, some measures that uh, are uh, taken into consideration for the uh, immune business standard, uh, focusing on uh, building receptions, for example, or other common areas. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, basically, if I just set out the seven sections and then I can go into, into depth. Um, but section one, we start off with leg legislation, governance. Um, also within that section is the personnel um, and also the immune designated spaces. Just to touch on those before we move on, what we've looked at is we want a champion um, for the immune building standards. And Somebody in charge? That... In charge, exactly. And, and we've put down, we've called him the immune building steward. But in essence, he's the central person, um, as I say, the champion for the standards. So he is the person that is bringing it all together. He's the link between what the building is doing, what the building maintenance and facilities managers are doing, to the occupants of that building, and also externally to the, to the healthcare service, etc. So he's the linchpin that links all of those entities together. He knows the standards. He's uh, addressed in when an event occurs, whether it be a pandemic like this, what measures to implement at what times. So he, he is running the standard and, and has a full understanding of what the important measures are and what should be implemented when and how to communicate those. And we think that we need that person to champion this scenario so that people know where to go, whether they're concerned about their, their well-being or their health issues, that they have somebody that they can see is designated for that line. So that, that's his role. We then have under that same chapter one, um, designated immune designated spaces. Um, and what we've done here is we've looked at areas that we believe the building should incorporate. They, they, they'll be new to the buildings in, in most cases, but this is such things like the immune quarantine room. Um, and basically that is, that's a room that has been set up and engineered to put a deal with people and give them a safe, comfortable, relaxed place while also isolating them from the remaining occupants of the building. In case there is a If they are problem. detected with, yes. with COVID. Because what, what we've heard is we have all the scanners or, or the detection measures that will be set up in the receptions, which I'll get to when we get there. Um, but if somebody is detected, what we kind of heard is, well, then they're refused entry to the building. But then if they're back on the outside of the building, what are they going to do? How are they going to get home? If, if they believe they're infected or they're showing uh, signs of being infected, they're one, they're going to be very nervous and upset. Um, and two, they've got to try to find their way back without, let's say, coming into contact with too many others. Because if they came by public transport, you're basically saying, well, we've recognised the, the symptoms. By the way, you're not allowed to enter the building. Find your own way home. And we just didn't think that was a logical step to take. So what we kind of looked at to say is if people are showing symptoms either on entry or they're working in the building and they feel not correct and they feel that they're coming down with something, the first thing to do is to give them somewhere that they can relax and take stock of what's happening to them. And also then to start planning. How do I get home? How, how, who do I need to call? Who do I need to ring? Do I need to get my family to collect? Do I need to call the emergency services direct? And again, they'll be in you know, conversation with the immune building steward, as I mentioned, a key role. Um, but also we've taken the step to isolate them from the, the main populace of the building so that the transmission doesn't continue. 
So they're isolated and safe and sure. So and in a medium that is safe, and it also uh, is also relax relaxing. It's not uh, like a prison or something. Uh, absolutely, one of the key things is to be relaxed. I mean, when you're faced with having a detection, or you or you've got that understanding that you may be infected, it's not a nice scenario. You're going to panic. You're going to maybe, you know, get very concerned about yourselves. So what we don't want to do is stress them out more. What we want to do is give them a nice ideal place to sort of take stock, um, be given advice, be able to speak to the build, um, immune building steward, um, get some feeling of calm while they plan on, on what it is they need to do. Because as you correctly say, we don't want to put them in prison or right, feel like they're abandoned from the world. They're, they're provided with all the information they need from the immune building steward. They're provided in a safe environment. They're given the right protection measure if they didn't have it. The room is kitted out and engineered that they will have antivirus units and air purification. There'll be water that has been purified. So they'll be given all the right treatment in a safe environment that's calm for them to allow them to plan when when they're not under the as much stress as, as maybe they could have been after finding out they are possibly detected for COVID. So that, that's the idea behind it, to, to make sure the person feels good um, or as, as well as he can um, while he makes his plans and, and to make that calm for him and, and relaxed, but also safe but also safe for the other occupants. That's key as well, that obviously one of the ideas is you have to stop transmission throughout the building. And to minimize the risk. Absolutely, so that's why that um, we believe the immune quarantine room and the isolation rooms, they sound harsh by the name, such as isolation and quarantine, but in, in actuality, they are doing the isolation and quarantine, but in a, a pleasant manner where people can feel relaxed and looked after. Um, Coming back to the reception and common areas? Yeah, can... for the reception and common areas, um, we picked up, I think we've been into many buildings now where um, what the government are saying and the, the WHO are saying, people are seeing evidence of those. Um, so the immune standard, it would be remiss if we didn't take those into consideration. So we do highlight those within the reception areas, but that's the start of our standards. So you would expect to walk in and see screens. You would expect to see social distancing. Everything that is encouraged are within our standards. We, we know that that's happening. It's what the governments are pushing forward. The WHOs are pushing forward, the wearing of PPE, etc. Um, what we've further tried to develop is we've looked at the egress and ingress. Um, can we separate them so that we are limiting the uh, cross-transference um, so there is clear routes in so that people aren't coming face-to-face -face or minimising that face-to-face -face contact. Entering one way, exit another way. Exactly. So it's providing a clear route so that people are trying to avoid crossover where, where absolutely possible. Um, so that's exactly the point. We've come in one way. We have a way to get to our unit, coming out a different way. And, and not integrating the two. Now, obviously, there are going to be pinch points, um, such as lift lobbies. Um, so we've looked at those. Um, I think a lot of uh, people will see that the lifts are reduced in capacity. So again, we, we agree with those. Um, so we've got the signage saying that the lift should only take a maximum capacity to allow spacing. Um, we went a little bit further to look at how we can program lifts to, to do that. Um, we also looked at how we can take the traffic off the lifts. So we've encouraged use of uh, secondary circulation, such as uh, staircases. Certainly for the lower levels, we understand for the upper levels, the lifts may still be a requirement. But for the lower levels, we've looked to provide alternative routing. Um, going back to the lifts, we're also looking to introduce UV um, to ensure, which is a cleaning device. UV has to be looked at carefully, um, so we made sure that that's what our measures are doing, so that you know um, people aren't blinded with UV or they don't get skin irritation. So it has to be engineered correctly. But we're looking at the UV to to treat the lifts, the surfaces, the lift shafts themselves, to make sure they're 
reducing the uh, level. I think by introducing UV, you can clean, uh, clear out 99% of the many viruses, not COVID specific, but generally viruses across the board. Um, we've looked at air purification. So even within that um, lift space, how can we improve the air within that confined space? So we've looked at air purification measures. Again, that could be by UV, it could be by ionization. Um, the other factor is um, touchless controls. Um, obviously in areas of high contact, we try to limit the different number of people touching the same surface. So if we look at it in consideration of a lift, you've got the buttons that everybody yes. is, several people. So we're looking at measures to say, well, can we take out this by using contactless? Now, the measures provide the idea. There are several solutions to that idea. This could be via foot pedal um, to call the lift instead of touching with the hands. It can be done with apps. It can be done with cards. So there are a number of different solutions to the measure, but we've provided the measure saying this is what Maybe you should be doing. Voice uh, control. Can voice be control is another. What what we tried in the measures to do is rather than pick out one of those, we've worded the measure to say think about making your lifts contactless. Try to bring in a solution. An that alternative to touch. Putting it. Yes, exactly. And then that leaves the, the potential person able to make several choices, uh, depending on budget, depending on what lift system he's, he has already installed. They need to then think, well, how can we do that with our exi existing um, lift setup? So it, it doesn't restrict the possibility of introducing the measure. It's saying that's what we're trying to do, avoid people, there are many solutions. We can help you with it. We even make suggestions on the back or the guidelines to say here are many different solutions. Um, but ultimately, we try to place the measure and what it is trying to achieve and then provide guidelines to the technical solutions. But at the end of the day, if they can prove that the objective of the measure is taken, that points can then be allocated. So we felt variety in the solution should be left there so that they know they can pick one that fits for them. Um, so that's just another area in the lobby. Um, we're looking at um, differing cleaning regimes as well. Um, and again, that sounds like it's more procedural, but we're also looking at the types of cleaning. Um, I, I think I mentioned the UV. The, um, we're also looking at what are the surfaces um, we're looking at antibacterial paints that the viruses do not last long on. I mean, this is using nanotechnologies, different surfaces. The viruses can stay, uh, stay for different durations. So what we're trying to encourage in our measures is to use surfaces that, let's say, protect you against viruses and try to eliminate those viruses over a shorter period of time. I want to ask you about... Uh the implications in the cost for uh, these uh, measures. Of course, if we take into consideration having people at home, uh, all costs involves, uh, regardless the amount uh, uh, should be made, but of course the owners of the buildings also have to take into consideration the cost. Is it Absolutely. cost prohibitive? to implement those kind of measures? No, we, we don't think so. Um, the first thing that we, we, we would say is when considering the costs, you need to consider the benefits. Uh, and this one is the benefit is human lives and, and human health. So and I, I don't has think no we cost. can lose that. Yes. You know, it, it's when you're considering costs, you, you have to look at the equation. What is it we're actually trying to achieve? But we are also, you know, we know that companies do care about costs. This is natural. Every company cares about costs. So what we believe we've done with the, the standards is with these different ratings, there is always a solution available for the differing budgets. Now, if you are looking at the very top end, then we do believe that, you know, significant or capital investment is needed. Um, 
We would estimate, and it has, it's a very rough estimate, it depends on so many tangibles that this can only be given as an, an outline guide. Um, but we believe it should be less than 2% of the, the investment Total cost. cost yeah. And I, as I say, it needs to be considered over so many different, what, what is the, um, the state of your existing facilities? What can it all already manage? Um, for an example, when we're talking about filtration, we want to increase filtration levels logically to take out the mure impurities, but air handling units will already be in existence and adding increased filtration adds resistance, which means that it could impact on the sizing of your air handling unit. So we are aware that if you wish to go and implement a fully resilient, there may be costs incurred. Um, but on the other side of it, if you're looking to un undertake, let's say, the proven also, then, then the proven factual um, measures, you don't have to spend a great deal. A lot of it, if you're looking for the strong, a lot of it will ge uh, generate around procedures. Have you put in the place in the right procedure? Now, I know procedure also has cost because it relates on you know, human activities, but it's a, a less significant cost than re-engineering. So we believe that there are measures, both you know, in facilities management, again, in architectural design, in engineering, that will suit all of the budgets. Um, it, it's just what is the aim, what is the starting point, and how much they, uh, the, the shareholder or stakeholder is prepared and considers necessary for the safety of his own um, office staff. Because uh, most of the time people uh, spend uh, their uh, uh, activity in the office area, in the main office area, not in the lobby, not in the restroom. They will pass through, but they will stay mostly in the office area. What would be the most uh, critical measures within the office area? Um, I'll deal with some of the, let's say, probably more procedural or governance ones first, because for me they, 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 they sound logic. And Please. we have touched on, as I say, from very logical to sort of more technical. Um, but for the first um, port, port of call, they need to look at how their work systems are set up. That means should they look at um, shift working um, to, to reduce occupancy levels, etc. The other one that we, we sort of look to whether um, permitting is to whether they can take advantage of any outdoor areas, um, whether this be for, for lunch time um, and recreational time, or whether it be for, for meetings that don't need quite a, a formal event. And, you know, there, there's opportunity to take work outside if the park allows. Um, Fortunately, where uh, Genesis Business Parks, they allow, allow these external areas. So it's kind of looking at, can you bring into the natural working day, encouraging the use of outdoor working or outdoor um, relaxation times? Again, that takes pressure off things like the canteens, etc. so you can move it out. It also gives them um, availability to natural ventilation, which is, is important. Natural light as well. Natural light. So those are sort of, let's say, procedural issues that we think would help. And they are within our measures because we think they're important. They, they may be relatively simple to, to understand and implement, but they still have a, a, a good degree of importance. Um, but the other ones that we are looking at is, and, and it's getting proven more and more, is the, the ventilation system and the air quality. Um, this is now being looked at more and more and it has had inputs from all the international um, heating ventilation companies. So there are a lot of measures within there. Um, and what we've looked at is, um, on this one, ionisation. Um, this is introducing ions to break down the bacteria and killing the virus. Um, these can be implemented either within the air handling unit, they can be implemented within the duct working system, but also they can be integrated standalone. There are standalone air purifiers, as I'm sure we know, that you can um, literally plug in and they will draw the air in, send them through the process of the air purification and put it back. 
So air purification is one of the, the key aspects. Um, what we're also doing again is to make sure um, that the cleaning scenarios within those office places um, are updated. Again, that's a procedural, but also technology again, I'll bring in the UV. Um, within our business parks, we're looking to bring in, um, let's say robotics into the scenario so that we can start looking at providing the UV cleaning remotely or electronically. Um, so that these are other ideas that can come in, but the idea is that the work surfaces need a higher degree of cleansing and cleaning and disinfection. So the measures again will place that down there and then there are several interpretations. But obviously we're now but seeing more of the UV um, solutions coming into play. So there's another one for the offices. And again, it was mentioned for the um, entrances, but circulation again. Um, how people get round those offices. We're also looking at the occupancy levels. Are people spread out enough? Again, back to social distancing, it makes sense people are to keep apart. In this time, have those measures been achieved? Um, we're even looking at, there are several technologies now that can map the offices to show which desks are in use, which desks are not in use. Um, that can be linked to the cleaning scenarios that once people are not using a desk, we make sure that the cleaning regime comes in and that those desks are cleared prior to anybody else touching the surfaces or utilising the desk space. It's a very, very complex uh, system and I'm glad that uh, this uh, immune business uh, and uh, immune uh, building standard is in place and provide, uh, provides uh, people with uh, a kind of a guarantee that uh, they are taken care of uh, from the health point, point of view. Uh, we are at the, at the end of uh, our uh, show today, but uh, I want to uh, ask you to uh, underline uh, a little bit, maybe in one minute, um, what are the main contribut contributors to this standard and uh, that can uh, provide a kind of uh, um, trust yeah. for the people. I'm very glad you picked up on that point. The, 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 the standard is open source. Um, the reason behind that is there are new discoveries on how the virus is changing. Um, there is new medical information on how it's transmitting. Um, and there's also new engineering solutions on how to combat these. So we believe that the the right way to deal with this was to make it open source so we are getting as much information from the varying specialities across the board. Now we, are, we have been um, fortunate enough to have a lot of contributors coming up and, th and they're covering all the realms as we said it's multidisciplinary so we've had contributors in the engineering um, such as the likes of Arabs, etc. We've had contributors in FM, such as the Maces of this world. We've had contributors in architecture uh, for Woods Bagger. So th these are really big international companies that you know are on the front edge of innovation, and they have looked to the standards and said you know they'll contribute to their level. So I mentioned a few of the big ones there. Um, but from our site, we're getting a lot of input from smaller companies that may not be as recognised, but they are leading their fight against this virus. And they are doing it correctly. They're going out, they're making sure it's covered medically, they have the right sign-offs, they have the right uh, stamps. So we're very interested in those smaller companies as well, saying, look, we specialise in a certain product. It might be a very small part of the overall measures, but they're very specialist in it and have done the research to support that it is protecting against the, vi the virus. Obviously, we take those and we then check them with the larger entities that I mentioned earlier to make sure that everything is covered and is safe. But their input is invaluable. So what we are really trying to do, although I can mention the high level names, is we're trying to get contributions from any party that believe they have a product or an idea or an interest in making healthier buildings. So we encourage the more contributors, the better. 
Um, we want people to join us in this, let's call it a, a fight against this hidden enemy um, and pull the measures together that will help us resist um, and at least be better prepared in the future. Because although I've spoke a lot about this current pandemic, our vision isn't for this current pandemic. Our vision is to have healthier buildings across the board. And that's to face any new threats that come up and ones that we see annually, such as influenza, etc. So the idea is let's make our buildings healthier. And that's the underlying current. Thank you. We'll uh, remain with uh, this conclusion. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonner, for this uh, interview. And I hope we'll have uh, future opportunities to dip uh, into it and uh, touch uh, different other areas uh, of uh, what is uh, happening in the marketplace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Vă mulțumesc și dumneavoastră, stimați telespectatori, pentru că ne-ați urmărit și vă invit să rămâneți alături de programele Canal 33. Revenim după o scurtă pauză publicitară.